So today I'm going to talk about mental skills, and this is something that's very personal to me because I did have a very long sort of meandering baseball career. I was a walk-on in college, um, earned a little bit of scholarship money later on, sort of like a thanks for doing good here. Um, but I was sort of like always the underdog. And as I kept progressing, and I did play six years of pro ball, I still maintained that sort of persona. And so for me, I had to sort of tap as much into myself as I could. And with a lot of, you know, as we climb the ladder, we're challenged in new ways, and we also have to find new ways to pull ourselves up to those levels. So this was me as a little guy. I have a little bit of a Harry Potter likeness with the glasses on. Um, got some corrective uh, surgery and, and grew up a little bit later. But I like to talk with a, or start with a story. So before we can talk about why we need mental training and what I think you should do for your players for mental training, we need to understand why do we even need it, right? It's becoming more and more prevalent. I think 10 years ago, you were just, level, le or just labeled a head case if you needed any kind of mental skills training, performance training. But it's pretty mainstream now. Every major league team has their own mental skills coach, if not multiple. So this is something that's becoming more and more part of every day, which is great. But why do we need it? What does it actually do? So I want to tell you a quick story. And this was an event that shaped the rest of my life. When I was, uh, it was my second year in pro baseball. And I, was, I started the year with a, a team called the Lake County Fielders in Lake County, Illinois. And the team was doing well. I was the number four starter. And we financially collapsed about halfway through. So I had to find a new team. And I quickly got scooped up by the Fargo Moorhead Red Hawks of the American Association. And they're a perennial winner. They really wanted me, which was new for me. I was always a walk-on, like, just give me a chance kind of guy. And suddenly they're like, hey, there's this, new, this pitcher who's doing well. Let's scoop him up. Like, he's going to jump right in a rotation. This was the first time that I had any expectations. People expected me to pitch well on this good team. And so I go up to Fargo, pitch poorly my first time out, pitch poorly my second time out. So now I'm on this new team. and. I'm the kind of guy who I want to contribute before I start palling around and, and being one of the guys. I want to make sure that I, I contribute something to our ball club. I hadn't done that. So after my second start, I get pulled from the rotation. And I was going to pitch at this ballpark in Gary, Indiana. And I actually invite a lot of my clients and friends from here in Illinois to come watch me pitch. So right off the bat, I was embarrassed that I had to call them back and say, hey, I got yanked from the rotation. I'm not going to pitch on the night I told you I was. So I go to the bullpen. They put me in the bullpen. And most of the time, when a player is new to the bullpen, or new if you get called to the big leagues, they'll put you in a low pressure situation, right? Makes sense, kind of ease you in. But here we were in this ballpark on a Friday night, about 4,000 fans there. And it was the ninth inning, and it was like a six to six ball game. You know, I'm sitting there, I don't know how to be a reliever. I hadn't done it since I was a freshman in college six years earlier. But yet, they said, hey, if we tie in the ninth, if we're, if we're still tied in the ninth, blew it's in the game. I said, oh, OK. Uh, I'll do this warm-up thing, which I don't really know what I'm supposed to do. I'm used to being a starter, but I'll give it a shot. So I go in, I pitch a good ninth. One, two, three, like two strikeouts and a fly out. No big deal. Um, after that, my pitching coach kind of goes to bat for me. He says, hey, how you feel? Like, I want to send you back out. I'm going to tell our head coach, a guy named Simi, I'm going to tell him to send you back out. Do you want to go back out? I said, sure, yeah, like, that, was, that was fine. So I go back out, get an out, give up a hit, and after I think one or two outs, we've got the winning run on second base, and their best hitter is coming up. So mound visit, and our pitching coach comes out, and he says, hey, you know, you got a base open, so let's, you know, be careful, probably start, start him off with off speed. So we just settled on a changeup. I was going to start this left-handed hitter off on a changeup. Not my best pitch, but it definitely made sense for the situation. You know, he departs, I stay on the mound. Two or three pitches later, I hang a changeup, chest high. He hits it in the, in just flaring down the left field line. I watch it, just like begging it, just please, just go foul. And it doesn't. It stays in. Uh, so now I've joined the team as I walk off the field, as they mob the guy at the home plate. Um, I've been in three games, and I've given our, given our team three losses. I'm 0-3. My ERA is like 7. So we stream up. It's a beautiful ballpark. We stream up to this big clubhouse. And we get there, this big, big open room. And I just sit down in my locker. And I just stare at the floor. I, I know only one guy on the team. You know, I'm like the new guy that can't get anyone out. And I just hope that I would just like dissolve into that floor. 
That was my goal. And finally, our manager and our pitching coach walked through. They slammed the door of the coach's office, and our manager, this very cutthroat, like known to be harsh kind of guy, he, his voice rings out a moment later. So I'm sitting there. We're all dead silent. We've lost like six straight. This game was not great. And from the paper-thin walls, I hear him reaming my pitching coach out. And he goes, you said to send him back out. You said he was lights out, but he stinks. He effing stinks. I censored it. He did not censor it. Um, so that was me. Imagine yourself in this new place with all these new teammates that you're trying to impress, and your coach at the top of his lungs screams that you stink. So I had never in my life wanted to quit baseball before that moment. I, I just tried to go shower, and I got a peanut butter and jelly, went and sat on the bus, and just counted down the minutes. It was like 45 minutes before that bus left. Longest 45 minutes of my life. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I don't know how I was going to get better. Um, and for the rest of that season, I was pretty broken up here. I didn't know how to pitch to that level. It was a higher level of baseball. I just continued to struggle, and I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I had never faced confidence issues as a player, but here I was. I go out there, and I expect to walk guys. I expect to get hit. I expect to lose. And that's where you say, how did I get here three weeks earlier? My last game with the previous team, I threw a complete game. We won four to one, and there were four ex-major leaguers in the lineup. I hit 93 in the ninth inning. I was cruising, and then a couple weeks later, I was broken. And so that is why we need mental skills training, because that was not the end of my story. That was a very big turning point for me as a human being, and I'm thankful for that story, as hard as it was, because it spurred me to make a lot of changes that I didn't previously know I needed. I didn't have that armor yet because I'd never been faced with something like that. And so these are the biggest problems I think that you're going to face with your players, whether they're 8 years old, 12 years old, 16 years old. There's a lot of bad luck in baseball. Baseball is a, it's an amazing sport, but it's also profoundly cruel because of how much luck is involved. It's not like football where you lay the guy out and he's just going to go down and the play is over. You can make a great pitch and lose a game and I've, made, I've done that many, many times. Players crumble under pressure. Pitching especially is very, very difficult because you have this time gap, right, where you can sit there and think about all the bad things that might happen if you don't make your pitch. And then lastly, players give up. After they make a mistake, like after I got you know, embarrassed in that clubhouse, you're afraid to do it next time, right? Everyone here in this room has seen your shortstop boot a ground ball just to do what on the next one? Boot that one too, right? So these are the three problems that I hope that we can tackle today. I can give you a little bit of insight into how we can do this right from the get-go. Because especially as amateur coaches, this isn't like a big exercise-heavy age. They're not going to sit down and meditate like I learned to after that summer in Fargo. Your kids are going to still be kids and do all these other things. So it's a lot of different strategies for you to help, um, help your players understand what's expected of them, what the standard they're going to be held to if they want to be really good ball players, play in college, play professionally, um, and eventually become the men that you also want them to be. So I'm going to go through 10 things that I think you can really do to help your players and how you can do them. So number one, the biggest thing is routine. So I mentioned in my story that I didn't know how to be a reliever. I was a starter, and I had my, everything I did mapped out, right, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday day one, day two, day three, day four. Routine is something that it's undertaught, and it's hard to understand exactly what does a kid need to do. But when I went and, you know, I owned a baseball academy for a long time, when I would go to these tournaments, I would see players on the other team, they're starting pitchers ready and sitting in the dugout 20 minutes for his game. So he's just getting cold. And my guys, this was just me helping share some of my years of experience, I said, no, when do you want to be in the dugout? They say, I don't know. I said, well, let's shoot for five minutes for the game. So if you're going to be in the dugout at 12.55 for a 1 p.m. game, how long do you need to throw? How much, how much in the bullpen do you like? Ten minutes? Okay. Well, then how much do you want to throw in the outfield? Ten minutes? Okay. How far do you want to go out? Eh, like 200 feet. Okay. How much do you want to warm up before that? Like getting your body loose, doing some sprints, some calisthenics, stuff like that. So we start to backtrack it. We make the stepping stones from 12.55 to all, you know, if it's 42 minutes, then it's, let me do this mental math here, um, 12.13. So at 12.13, your routine starts. 
So at 12.55, you've done everything you need to do to be as ready as you can be for the game. And that's not a complex thing. It just takes sitting down with your players. And I like worksheets for this. I would make my guys at least twice a year write down their routine to the minute. So at 12.42, what are you doing? You're doing this for four minutes? Okay, what's a 12.46? Okay, what's a 12.51? Okay. There's a lot of repetition that's needed for them to really have this sink in. I've had a lot of kids that they play for me a couple of years, and then in high school ball, they still like, uh, don't know what their routine is. It's going to take time, so I would really encourage you to use worksheets and try to just track down what they think makes them successful, and then try to piece it together, whether it's pregame or whether it's their side session, whatever it is, and just try to help them form a routine. Because routines, they remove variables from the equation. If you pitch great and you warm up for 30 minutes, or you pitch bad and you warm up for 70 minutes, you're going to know there's something different, but you're not going to know what. And this is going to help smooth that out. Number two, don't let them crumple. And what I mean by this is I, I don't see many coaches doing mound visits before things get really ugly. And I probably led 15U baseball last year in mound visits when there wasn't anything apparently wrong. But when I see bad body language, I see a pitcher sort of ease off a pitch, those are really bad signs for me that something up here is going on and he's trying to control the game because he's thinking a lot and he's scared. So what I mean by crumple is this. When a pitcher's going good, everyone can see the body language is strong, right? The shoulders are back, they're moving quick, they're not thinking too much. But as soon as that pitcher walks a guy or gives up a hit, you start to see this. They turtle, their head gets like a turtle, right? Their shoulders start to round, their movements become a little slower, and you start to see them become a little less aggressive when they, the way they release a the pitch. Now, this can happen in hitting as well, obviously. You can see it in fielding. You know, they, they boot a ground ball, and they, you know, they go down. But with pitching, I try to intervene as quickly as I can, because if, I, if they're going here, they don't need me. If they're getting here and they're starting to get nervous, that's when I need to go and try to pull their shoulders back, figuratively, and get them just to relax and do your thing, and things are going fine. Try to intervene before it gets bad, because what happens is this, another walk, another hit, and suddenly your guys are mentally doing this, and you're not going to get them back. You're not going to bring them back that game. The floodgates are going to open, and it's pretty much over for the game. And that sixth spot that happens in that inning, you're not going to be able to come back from, right? So watch really, really hard, and don't be afraid to use mound visits, especially with pitching. And again, this is, you're not going to go out and talk to your shortstop, but this is an in-game intervention. If you see any kind of body, body language that looks negative, or they start to ease off a pitch and don't really finish it, that's when you need to go out there and talk to these guys. No, there's no delay of game. It's not a big deal. And just give guys a breather too, okay? So don't be afraid to try to pick them up before things get rough. Number three, this is another thing that I think is important with worksheets, because players are not going to want to offer up this information super readily, but we all have fears. I'll share mine. When I, was a, when I was a sophomore in college, I made big strides my freshman year. My sophomore year, I was slated to be the number four slash number five pitcher. So I had one guy to beat out to be in the rotation. My first time out, I was piggybacking with a guy who eventually pitched in the major leagues, a teammate of mine, good friend, and he, that meant he was going to pitch the first four or five, and I was going to pitch the last four or five, so we are going to split the game. I went out there, I, I came in like with two outs, I think, in the fifth, and it was kind of rough, but I got the last out. The next inning, it was like walk, walk, hit, walk, and I was yanked. It was bad. It was ugly. This was like my first real chance as a college baseball player. I got like 20 innings as a freshman, just like an inning here, inning there. This is my first chance to really like establish myself. I was going to get four innings, Division One baseballs against William and Mary, and I just really, I mean, to put my name in vain, I blew it. It was bad. And so, for the rest of my career, till the very last game I pitched at age 30, I was in the bullpen, ready to go in the game, and I was scared that I was going to walk three hitters in a row. It never ever left me. So, I wrote that down. I'm not, this is a real worksheet. Um, just by trying to be candid with players. So if you're a coach and you play, it doesn't matter what level you played at, you can share something that you, that you went through. That's going to help them open up. But everyone has these, and you might not know what they are, and they're often very irrational. I never did that again. I had pretty good control, 
I had good control before that day, I had good control after that day. My control was better some years than others. But I was not a go in and walk four guys kind of dude, I wasn't. And so that was just a genuinely irrational fear. If you're like, okay, well, Dan, why would you, why do you think you would walk, you know, three years in a row? You did that literally one time in 20 years. Yeah, exactly. And when you see it on paper, sometimes you realize the absurdity of it and kids can let that go.